hi angels and welcome back to my channel today is such an exciting day because i am finally doing a video like genre i guess that i've wanted to do for a long time and if you guessed by the title i'm doing my first video essay i felt it only was fitting if i had something to hold in my hands because i talk with my hands a lot but this is literally just peach green tea and today we're going to be dissecting the ugly fat friend trope in film and media. Otherwise known as the deaf. Hey everyone! Um, ah, I'm already crying! Not to be confused with the 2015 movie of the same name that we'll talk about later, Urban Dictionary defines the deaf as someone who doesn't necessarily have to be fat or ugly, but is less attractive than the friends they hang out with. That's a lot. In this video, we're going to deep dive into what a duff is, why it's so problematic, and some popular duffs in film and media. In this video, I'm strictly going to be speaking about female duffs because if I tried to conquer the male duff genre, this video would literally be three hours long. Jonah Hill, John C. Riley, Seth Rogen, I'm looking at you. And to truly understand the concept of the duff and why it's so harmful, we need to take it back to a much different time. A much skinnier time. A much simpler time will the crown they hit bottom heaven knows they'll survive this simple country in the 2000s, Paris and Nicole were essentially the definition of best friend goals before we even knew what that word was. Paris was born into the Hilton dynasty and Nicole was the adopted daughter of the great Lionel Richie. The two became friends when they met as children at the exclusive Buckley Hill in Los Angeles, California. According to family friends, the two were practically inseparable their entire life and in 2003, they were given their hit TV show, The Simple Life. People were obsessed with The Simple Life, me being one of them. I remember being a child, probably too young to watch the show, and just being obsessed with the concept and the girls. I found them genuinely so funny, and the idea of taking rich people and putting them into everyday things was like, I thought it was 10 out of 10, and people still love it. But the media did not have the same reaction that the public did. The media's reaction is what the media's reaction always is when they see two successful women doing anything together. Let's pit them against each other. And in the age of the ultra thin, what a better way to get the girlies fighting than comparing their weight. There were magazines and blog sites <clears throat> Paris Hilton, who constantly compared the two. Whenever the two would do photo shoots together, Paris would be in something super tiny and Y2K, and while Nicole, still fitting for the times, would be noticeably covered up. Blogs and websites continued to talk about their different body shapes and weights and from what was visible to the consumer and what Nicole Richie has said about her past in interviews. You could tell the tabloid shaming had gotten to her, and by season three, Nicole was as skinny, if not skinnier, than Paris herself. That didn't stop the media though. Things about her race, her being adopted and not technically born into a rich family like Paris was. Honestly it was all gross and toxic and I could do an entire video on fat phobia in the 2000s so let me know if you want me to traumatize myself for that video because I I will do it in the name of in the name of history in the name of lore. Should she suffer? All right clap if you think she should suffer. And by the way, I know Nicole Richie is not and has never been plus size, but you know what I mean. But we've learned about the most famous case of duffing, I guess, in media. Not take a shot every time I say the word duff because I do not want that on my conscience, and I'm gonna say it a lot in this video. By the way, before we jump into the video, I was thinking about doing Ty from Clueless, but I love Brittany Murphy too much, and I respect her too much to ever entertain the idea that she could have been anyone's duff. So, don't yell at me in the comments. Let's start with the duff. Here's my favorite duff. Sorry, what? Duff. D-U-F-F. Designated ugly fat friend. While my OCD brain wants to go in chronological order of release date, how can we not open a video about duffs with the movie based on the novel that coined the term? Duff is a comedy romance starring Mae Whitten as the titular character, and it was adapted by a novel of the same name from a really adorable author who actually wrote it when she was 17 named Cody. In the opening scene, we see Bianca, her two friends, and their stereotypes introduced. We have Jess, the kind one who likes yoga and being pretty. Kesey, the tough one who's a hacker and good at sports. What's kind of interesting about this is right off the bat, the movie shows us that in this cinematic universe, girls can be interested in more than one thing without being labeled. But Mae gets labeled as the duff simply because she has pretty friends and wears tomboy ass clothes. 
which is a really sad message to send. You're only interesting and complex if you are skinny and pretty, otherwise your hobbies and quirks are seen as negative attributes, leaving open the idea of why a girl who likes things that the boys like, doesn't express romantic interest in them, would be ostracized instead of taken in as one of the guys. Everything Bianca likes in this movie is negative and stereotyped and critiqued, and this starts first with her costuming. And she's dressed in typical not like other girls clothes throughout the movie. Doc Martens, ripped jeans, flannels, overall. You get the sense that she's trying to hide herself and her style. Yet if anyone would have looked at the selection of Urban Outfitters in 2015 when this movie was created, Bianca's outfit would have been like $350 plus tax. It's going out of its way to show us that Bianca is weird, a loner, and not like other girls. Noticed? I'm weird. I'm a weirdo. I don't fit in. Yet arguably all the things she likes and wears would make her popular with men. The reason people don't like her is because she's fat or ugly or a combination of both. Because it puts hypocrisy front and center. But Mae Whitten is like maybe a medium after Chipotle Burrito Bowl. So the descending to the viewer is that if Bianca is the duff and completely repulsive to everyone around her, what am I? This again will be a overarching narrative throughout these movies not casting plus size people to play plus size roles and putting negative stereotypes towards plus size people on straight size women further extending the arc of fat phobia and pushing eating disorder and diet culture onto people who have absolutely no reason to lose weight hey editing me i should clarify right here that i am no way implying that plus size women need to lose weight. I'm simply saying society's main goal is convincing plus size women the best thing they can do for themselves is lose weight. So by casting medium sized women in these roles, you are telling women of all shapes and sizes the best thing they can do is lose weight because you see people who have no reason to lose weight still being told they need to lose weight. Okay, enjoy the video. So here were my main problems with the duff. But what I didn't know was I had a brand new label. Friendship in the Duff is weird. Her friends are often rude and dismissive of her feelings. And in the opening scene, we see Bianca telling them she's not going to homecoming, which is something I will touch on frequently throughout this video. I don't understand why any screenwriter can simply let a plus size girl go to a dance. Anyways, Bianca brings up her favorite director in movies and her friends literally have no idea what she's talking about. They're completely unaware and uninterested in her hobbies. And then the movie's villain, Bella Thorne, I mean Madison Morgan, is introduced. Honestly, straight up evil to Bianca throughout this entire film, almost completely unprovoked. Yet Bianca's friends are friends with her. Scene highlights a trope that we see developed a lot in this movie, that plus size people are so happy to have friends they'll accept less than subpar ones. Like Wes. Clap if you care. Clap if you, clap if you care. Meet Wes at a party where he's talking to Bianca at the drinks table and he's actually the one to reveal to her her duff status. The party scene with Wes is bad, guys. Like, it's just... Is he referring to her in masculine terms, which is again problematic and stripping away the femininity from women you see undesirable? I thought Wes is the first person to bring up the idea that the Duff is weird and just kind of mean in my opinion. Friends since she was little, who she since grown apart from, just approaches her at a party to let her know that everyone, including him, are only friends with her because they want to get close to Justin Casey. Wes tells her is so casual and chill, he just completely cuts her down to her face. He's shocked when she throws the drink in his face, which was 100% deserved. Talk, you know what? Get back out there. Have some highlights the idea that people often believe duffs are supposed to be friendly and approachable. Again, playing into the stereotype that fat and ugly people are simply lucky to be brought along to social functions and therefore would never express upset or distaste. Bianca suddenly becoming aware of her status is another thing that kind of annoys me. Again, plays into the cinematic stereotype we see that plus size people are so jovial or clueless or unaware, no idea everyone who they thought liked them, really judging them, or hanging out with them as a joke. This trope on screen often manifests into real life girls second guessing and doubting if potential lovers or friends are actually interested in them. And of course she's super smart and has to help him pass science so he can make her hot. I then see Wes take her to Victoria's Secret in this really weird scene because he apparently he knows all the sales associates because he likes 
to watch home makeover shows. The whole scene is annoying for many reasons. One, because Wes has this line about how her clothes don't show off her personality and he doesn't know who she is based on what she's wearing. It's like, I mean, don't you? Like, she's expressed her feelings, which she's like over and over again. It's hard to miss if you just literally listen to Bianca talk. She talks about her music. She talks about the movies she likes. She has the same color palette and silhouettes as well, giving us an idea of what she likes fashion-wise. This scene, you just get the vibe that, again, Wes is saying, I'm not interested in knowing who you are because you're not hot enough to look at. Bianca's also supposed to be super uncomfortable with being girly yet in this scene she tries on crop tops and bows and she's dancing around and doesn't care. I do think the funnest or maybe the saddest part about this scene is how much Wes is having fun with her. Her personality is making him laugh and they're even flirting a little bit. Just reiterating he does like her and he would be with her if he could get past society's stereotype about dating the deaf. Toby gives Bianca a love interest in Toby and he really likes her and he wants her and he goes out of her way, his way to like woo her. He actually invites her over to his house where he makes her sushi. And I find this whole thing funny because despite being the dove, she actually ends up midway through the movie in a love triangle with Wes and Toby, who are the most popular boys in the school. It's like the movie abandoned the idea that she was physically repulsive to everybody and suddenly through letting the dove speak, they see her worth. Except for Toby is literally trash and you guessed it, only wants her for Justin Casey. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, just sweet scene between her and Russ where they go to a childhood rock that they shared and you got the idea that he's finally going to pick her and realize that Duff has worth and he's been in love with her since the beginning until he takes Madison, her mortal enemy there, and kisses her. Then at prom, the first scene in cinematic history is filmed. I'm just kidding but like it's so bad like it's so bad. Wes stands silently while Madison drags Bianca for filth. Like, I mean, she dragged her guys. And then in her clapback, Bianca talks about how everyone is someone's duff. And Madison is a clown for not realizing what a great guy that Wes is. Okay, let's move on. And Wes chooses her in the end in a very mean girl esque scene. And it's a very unempowering, bizarre ending that leaves us with the plus size girl settling for a guy who made her a second choice, friends who don't invest in her, and a school who bullied her relentlessly. The overall message it echoes is that plus size people often accept the love they think they deserve. And instead of having one of her friends or herself stand up to Bianca and tell her the concept of the duff is completely ridiculous and misogynistic, gives a lackluster speech and assumes her position on Wes's arm. This movie never successfully proves that Bianca was a duff who was transformed or that the label duff is ridiculous and who needs labels. The thing I did like about the duff is they didn't change her to fit in. Um, she had her terrible realization, but she did it dressed like her and while stating her comfortability with looking and acting like herself, which I enjoyed and appreciated. I don't think that alternative which is what they're going for with May's character, plus size people need to conform to basic or trendy styles to be more palatable for relationships. Now we solidified what a duff is and covered the titular film about the phrase, let's travel back in time, we coin the term, and look at some more of our designated ugly fat friends. To the pants and the sisterhood together and the rest of our lives. Well, before you come at me and say that Carmen isn't the duff, listen, I am never going to sit here and argue that America Ferreira could be anyone's duff. She's literally 10 out of 10 in the Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants movies and books and this article about the release I found from the LA Times in 2005, they all refer to Carmen as awkward and chubby. And since they refused to cast anybody over a size large in the 2000s, most of our duffs are going to be 2000 beauty standards. Carmen is part of the four-person girl group from the 2005 cult classic The Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, adapted from Anne Rasher's 2001 novel of the same name. Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, which I will now be referring to Sisterhood because that is literally such a long name, wow, follows four friends as they all spread out and experience a coming of age summer. The premise of the story is basically four friends that find these like magical pants. They're like magical in a spiritual way, like not a Harry Potter way. They'll wear the pants, emailing them back and forth with letters and updates. Honestly, it's such a good movie. It's one of my faves from my childhood. It gives me Gilmore Girl vibes. It's a great watch in the fall. The girls are Lena, Tibby, Bridget, and Carmen, who is the curvy one and who just happens to be Latina, the only woman of color, 
which do not worry, we will touch on later. The beginning of the movie makes it quite clear that outside of Carmen's problems with her single mother and mildly absent father, body image and confidence are going to be the main plots of her coming of age. Carmen does have a love interest in the film named Ian, we will talk about that later, but it's pretty apparent that the summer of love that Lena and Bridget are going to experience is on the cards for Carmen. And Tibby, I don't know <laughs> what the writers did with Tibby, but she was going through it. That's another video. Anyway. The iconic scene where the girls find the pants at the thrift store, when it's Carmen turn to try on the pants literally smacks her thighs and says you think that a pair of jeans that fits all three of you is going to fit all of this it's really sad for this to be her characterization because i remember as a child watching this movie and thinking the exact same thing carmen did there was no way on earth a pair of pants that fit my friends would ever fit me but i so desperately wanted the movie to prove me wrong all it did spoiler alert the pants do end up fitting carmen it hurt to have your fears be vocalized by a cool older teen girl. The semi-realization of, wow, I may never grow out of feeling this way, despite how cool others may think I am. I mean, comparing yourself to your friends and self-shaming. We've all been there, am I right, ladies? But once again, if you notice in the scene, her supportive sisters don't really say much. Pretty. I hate you. I'm not here to act. I'm just doing some backstage work. In terms of costuming, Carmen looks pretty good throughout the movie. She's often in form-fitting clothes, halter tops, colorful pants. And honestly, she's pretty on trend for the time period and low-key kind of like right now. For one thing that is notably different with Carmen is with her friends and family, she's in her tight, trendy clothes. But anytime we see her on screen around Ian, she's in baggier, looser clothes portraying her unsurety and uncomfortableness around the opposite sex. So things I didn't like about Sisterhood. You think that a pair of jeans that fits all three of you is going to fit all of this? So I want to tread really lightly here because I am not Latina and I don't speak for the community, but I think it's important to speak on this issue. The rise of BBL mania, it's hard to look back at movies where women of color, especially Latina women, were cast specifically for their curvy bodies to be turned around and labeled as vixens or someone uncomfortable with their larger asset. Looking back through the lens of 2000's fat phobia, it's even sadder to have Latina representation in a coming of age film be about how her Puerto Rican body makes her look different from everybody else, showing us society's tendency to shame women for one thing and then praise it in years to come. Women's issues with her body and her proud Puerto Rican identity come to a head in a scene filmed in a bridal shop. Carmen tries on a bridesmaid's dress for her absent father's new wedding and honestly, the dress looks amazing on her body. However, the southern shopkeepers are honestly being quite weird and rude about it, when realistically, it's like a half a size or a size too small. Staff making a big deal out of this moment felt like a realistic experience for a plus-size girl in a coming-of-age movie. I feel like normal things, like a dress not fitting for a special occasion, can be quite emotional for any young girl. But instead of the writers having the dressmakers calm her down and tell her they have a bigger size and a positive twist, the writers do this. Mr. Fabric. Just tell everyone that Carmen's Puerto Rican, but unlike you and your daughter, she has a booty! And she's Puerto Rican, so she's different because she's thick. And I just don't love this for Carmen. I wish they would have truly tackled the race issue if they wanted to go there, but these stereotypes are just so outdated that they're hard to watch. They honestly read super corny and not that emotional. Um, and Carmen kind of became slightly villainized in this moment, and I hate how plus size women are frequently written as flippant skinny shamers, yet are sensitive to their own body struggles because I find that to be the opposite of how most plus size women view skinny shaming. You guys act like you've never heard people say this before. It's just because I'm gonna step. I'm actually gonna say what everyone else is thinking because it's the truth. In many ways, Carmen is an outsider, being the only woman of color in her friend group and her family and the only plus size person in both groups. In each group, she's the perpetual hanger on her and we see that's how she views herself in her interactions with Ian. We meet Ian when Carmen is backstage at a summer camp theater production and they bond over their love of Shakespeare. But Carmen, despite being an avid lover, refuses to audition and is forced into doing so when Ian pulls her on stage. He's awkward and doesn't really try and the director is kind of just like, okay, thank you. And she runs off stage all embarrassed. She also says one of the saddest lines I've ever heard, just kind of looks at Ian and goes, I'm exactly where I belong. And it just goes to further prove that Carmen believes she belongs on the outskirts and the shadows and the movie does a lot to show us that the people in her life treat her the same way, but not 
Ian. I'm just kidding. I do like Ian and I think he's really supportive and sweet. I just hated that a skinny man had to force her to audition. It's almost as if she had zero self-confidence simply existing and the plus size girl shrinking her self-characterization is not only super sad but just super overdone. Carmen eventually realizes her worth when she stands up to her absent father on the phone and spoiler alert gets the lead in the play but throughout the entire film we get a sense of longing to be seen and heard and I low-key wish she would have made them see her nailed the audition and snatched the boy instead of a man making her realize her true potential all along. Carmen is ultimately a more dynamic and empowered character than our other Duffs, especially our next character who deserved so much better, but we'll get into that. Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, we see race and the Duff intersecting in a way that begs us to answer the question. In media and film, does the word ugly often refer to simply not white? And speaking of white, I hate California. I want to go to the East Coast. I want to go where culture is, like New, New York, York. I race or at least all. Connecticut. Guys, this one is bad. Like, I mean, it's a modern film set in the 2000s, so I expected it, but wowzers. The thing I will say before jumping into my dissection of Julie is. I've honestly watched Lady Bird like five plus times. I love this movie. I've seen it twice in films alone and obviously had to watch it again for this video. After watching Lady Bird through Julie's lens, it's essentially wears her uniform for most of the movie. I mean, we see glimpses of Y2K fits in the car scene at the concert, but they're very simple and just seem on trend for the time. What is noticeable about Julie's costuming is her perpetual immaculate heart hoodie. Not only does she wear it frequently, but when she's nervous, she fiddles with it and often uses it as a coping mechanism. Another scene I'll go in depth in later on where we see a costuming change for Julie on prom night, but honestly, her costuming is pretty absent just like her importance in this film. Pretty much throughout the entirety of the film, Christine, who I will interchangeably call Lady Bird because that's just how my ADHD rap brain works, given so much room for her feelings and growth, while Julie spends most of the film looking lucky to be Christine's friend. Opening monologue, we get shots of Julie in her faint hoodie cheering on Lady Bird as she runs for office. Something subtle the writers did that I actually liked here was the candidate before Lady Bird finishes her speech by saying, who wants a muffin with that many calories? All the girls clap, while Julie claps loudly and lets out a loud woo. She's simultaneously agreeing with the sentiment while letting it be known that above all others, she wants to lose weight. We also see her flirtatiously laughing at a teacher giving Arya Montgomery teas, and you just get the idea that Julie is pretty sheltered and naive, frequently looking to cooler people to give her confidence and inspiration. When they're signing up for the play is when I thought we got a sense of her true personality, silly and kind of like unwilling to take Lady Bird's BS. She puts her name in quotes and Lady Bird's angst in this scene is so funny. She tells Julie she doesn't need the quotes because a nickname and her name are the same thing. I feel like I just learned that normal is very boring and I feel like I'm not normal and I'm blessed to be not normal. Julie literally just looks at her and says, hmm, I don't think you're right, and walks away. This is gonna set up a very dry and loving vibe for their friendship, but then we have the rest of the movie. Well, you know your mom's tits that are totally fake. She made one bad decision at 19. Two bad decisions. Another scene, we see Julie and Christine reading magazines in the grocery store. Lady Bird opens the magazine to a model from New York City, and Julie says, oh, why don't I look like that? Yeah. Christine just kind of says, oh, same, I wish I looked like I belong in New York City. Really ignoring her friend and making it about herself, even though she is skinny and ends up at NYC in the movie. Not only throughout the entire film does Christine ignore Julie putting herself down, she often puts her down herself. A scene that I absolutely hate, we see Julie pull up to school and Christine takes the sandwich out of Julie's lunch bag. Starts to eat it, throws away Julie's entire lunch, and when Julie says, I just keep getting fatter, Christine replies, me too. Julie says, me too, while scarfing down a sandwich and cradling another one in her arm like a cherub for later. Julie is not only starving herself, she's doing it with Christine's help, while Christine gets to eat two sandwiches and again makes a situation about herself. Don't, don't, don't do it. Don't, don't. I mean, Greta, literally let's chat. Like, this scene, like... Let's, I just want to talk. Seeing this movie through the eyes of Julie made me realize how good Greta actually did with the characterization of teen friendship. 
Julie doesn't see the toxicity and unsupportive nature of the relationship and that's a common issue so many of these films have tried to tackle. Friends who don't lift you up or support you, yet you cling to them to live vicariously through them, as Julie does with Lady Bird. After Julie's amazing audition where she lands the starring role opposite Lady Bird's crush, she instantly chastises herself and says, I don't even know how I got the part. Christine literally says, me too. She says, me too. Like, I have no words. The way that Julie instantly minimizes herself is so hard to watch. Speaking of living vicariously through Lady Bird, we see Julie sobbing and her voice is cracking when they find Lady Bird's man in the stall with old dude. <laughs> oh my god, it's not funny. <laughs> And you just get the feeling that Julie feels like this is the closest she will ever get to heartbreak. And seeing Julie watch Christine blossom and experience real high school activities while most plus size girls miss out on this movie depressing. Julie tries to fit in with Jenna and Christine but she's iced out almost immediately from the group. I honestly don't see Julie on screen for a long time. She's gone for almost the entire beginning of Lady Bird's relationship with emo Timothy Chalamet. It's only once Lady Bird realizes her dad is depressed and her new bestie Anna Jenna loves Zack and wants to be a MILF does she miss her best friend. In the iconic center of attention monologue I can't do anything unless you're the you see Lady Bird miss Julie, yet she's rude and dismissive right away. This is funny because you kind of just get the vibe that Lady Bird misses having someone look at her like she hung the stars because in her friendship with Jenna, she has to look at her that way and she doesn't really like it. Plus, she knows that her friendship with Jenna is kind of just based on a big lie. She doesn't live in the big blue house. Julie basically calls her out for being a shitty friend and Lady Bird comes for her neck, shaming Julie's mom and saying that keeping Julie was a mistake. I don't know if this scene was supposed to be a lighthearted illustration of a petty fight between friends, but again, could it be me? Then see Lady Bird lose her V-card, get caught in a lie by Jenna, and she never thinks to call Julie, but when her prom night is going to be ruined because Jenna and emo Timothy want to ditch, suddenly remembers her best friend and races over to her house to find Julie. Because of course Julie wouldn't be at prom, because why do fat people go to dances if they're not going to go with their skinny friends? Anyways, here we see Julie's only other costuming. It is a big oversized yellow t-shirt. And I really like the decision right here. It kind of gives the sense that Julie is trying to self-soothe and look for a positive on such a painful night. I mean, Lady Bird literally walks in and she's on the couch sobbing. She also says something really sad here. She just kind of looks at Christine and she says, not everybody is born happy. And this scene really got to me. I felt for her so much. Um, and we actually find out that Julie had a dress for months but didn't go. Which again shows us how much of her high school experience is tied to the one friend she has, good or bad, Lady Bird. Prom, they dance together and there's like a scene with a nun here that's like really funny. It makes me sad because they take prom photos and you get the idea that Julie is taking prom photos with a girl that she will probably never see again. She's all ears hearing Lady Bird's story about losing her V-card. Kind of get the sense that she's done living vicariously through her. Lady Bird assumes they'll have all summer together and Julie surprises her by saying she's going to see her biological dad. The of the scene reads hopeful. She's cautiously optimistic she'll get a fresh start and some coming of age summer memory. By the way, watch Booksmart if you want to see the coming of age movie Beanie Feldstein deserved because that movie is amazing. This scene is shot at sunset kind of solidifying the ending of their friendship and we don't see Julie again until Lady Bird finds the prom photos packing for New York. Overall, I felt that although Julie had the least amount of screen time out of all of our duffs, the friendship between her and Christine was an accurate and nuanced portrayal of not only teen friendship but the power dichotomy between different bodies in teen friendship. Maybe I'm late watching this back, but I get the idea that Christine and Julie were never supposed to be that close. The story about high school friendships growing apart, and like most relationships in school, we see them together a lot simply because they're in school. They also bond over being low income in a prestigious arena, but their friendship is one of necessity for both survival and self-exploration. Greta deserves an A plus for that. It is sad that Julie was given so little, but I think that was the point. The harsh reality of our world is that plus size girls are never the center of attention for the coming of age film. We catch glimpses of them as they orbit around the lens of the main character, never really focusing or coming to fruition. And when characters like Christine, Libby, Jess, and Casey move on and shed their high school friends, the audience is left to wonder, are they simply shedding dead weight?